Listen, what a, what a pleasure to see you all today. I'm uh, so glad to be uh, here uh, at the uh, United Brotherhood of uh, Carpenters, uh, an opportunity for me uh, to come back here. I was here uh, a few years ago seeing the amazing work you were doing. Um, but it's been a tough few years uh, across the country. We've, uh, uh, we've dealt with a whole bunch of different upheavals in a whole bunch of different ways in a time around the world that is facing real challenges. Uh, we started, of course, uh, with a pandemic uh, that had us all uh, hunkering down and uncertain of how our loved ones were going to do. Um, we got through that because we leaned on each other as Canadians, uh, but lots of echoes of that, whether it's in mental health, whether it's uh, businesses still struggling and supply chains still challenged. And of course, as we came out of that, um, we started with the war in Ukraine as Russia invaded Ukraine illegally, illegitimately. Uh, and uh, has caused further disruptions to supply chains around the world, has challenged us in a huge number of ways uh, as a world on energy, on inflation, um, and also just the bounce back of our economy see, with uh, so many jobs created after we came out of the, uh, the pandemic has put pressures on cost of living, on inflation, interest rates going up to try and keep uh, inflation down. Um, mixed in with the general challenges that people are facing around the world, whether it's anxiety about climate change, anxiety about the pace of change and transformation of our communities, our businesses, our world, uh, the rate of how things are changing around the world is really destabilizing. And that's something that people are going through all around the world right now. And one of the challenges uh, that we're facing as communities is how to hold together. Because in times of anxiety, it's supernatural for people to fold in on themselves, to hunker down, hope the, the storm blows past, look out for your loved ones, look out for your small community, and focus on that. But we know that isolating ourselves, dividing ourselves, folding in on ourselves isn't the best way to succeed. That's not how this country got built over generations, over centuries, indeed over millennia with Indigenous peoples. It came by communities being there for each other, being open to each other, leaning on each other, learning from each other, and growing together. And that's what has made Canada one of the success, most successful democracies, one of the most successful countries in the world. You can come here from any corner of the world and build a life for yourself. Not to say it hasn't always been easy, because it hasn't. Not to say there hasn't been you know, real challenges around discrimination, whether it's indigenous peoples or uh, visible minorities. But we do a better job of understanding that differences can and will be sources of success. Opportunities to learn, to grow, to build resilience. At the same time, this anxiety, this fear people feel, it's easy to feel far from one each other. It's easy to feel divided. And what we do best as a country through those tough times. What we did during the pandemic, it's what we do every day when we're there for our neighbors, when we value a public universal health care system, when we believe in a strong social safety net, when we believe in the essential partnership that government has to have uh, with labor to make sure that unions are there to support and defend the middle class in this country. These are all things that work when we work together. So, um, about this country. And it's not just because of our geography, it's not just because of our you know, great trade relations around the world, it's not just because of uh, the opportunities we have to innovate and grow, it's because we're Canadians. When times are tough, we pull together, we build a better future. It doesn't mean we always agree on everything, it'd be boring if we did. But it does mean we are capable of building the best possible future for our kids and grandkids uh, and our fellow community members every single day when we get to it. And that's 
uh, why I am so optimistic about this country and why I'm so glad to be able to be here. First and foremost, to thank you. To thank you for all the work you've done. Thank you for all the work you continue to do building this country. We need more homes. We need more construction. We've got big projects as a country around infrastructure, around uh, creating uh, great, uh, new, richer, deeper communities that are welcoming in people from around the world. We need the kinds of uh, skilled jobs uh, that this training center and uh, this union is just so good at delivering for not just for all of you, but for the next generations as well. So I'm really excited to say thank you all for everything you do. And uh, looking forward to taking a few questions. Uh, so we have about an hour together, and uh, I'm looking forward. So if anyone has any questions for me, uh, let's just start up. I'll pick the first person brave enough to put up their hand. There you are. We'll start with you. Uh, we'll just get you a mic, uh, and then I will work my way around, uh, around the room. How are you doing, Mr. President? Mr. Prime Minister? Prime Minister. Sorry. Yeah. It's all good. Sorry. No, no. The no bravery. <laughs> What's your name? My name is Joshua Benio. I'm a member of Local 27. I am a proud former carpenter. And I just liked what you said, how there's, like, you know, there's anxiety going on. And to unsettle the anxiety in Canada, it's like we need to play our part. So what, I, what I'm asking is, what can we do to promote careers in the trades for more young people like myself? Uh, it's, a, it's a great question, Joshua. Um, the reality is the nature of work and careers are changing. We're seeing uh, so many jobs more precarious. We're seeing so many jobs uh, more of a gig economy. We're seeing so much uh, that is you know, coming in where there's no pension, there's few benefits, there's, there's real challenges in a job that is, you know, you come out of university, you get a job, come out of school, you get a job, and you don't know whether it's going to take you to retirement. You don't know what kind of stability it has. Unless, of course, you get a good union job. You get a job in the trades. I mean, I, I, I stand here in this training center that is proof positive that you will continue to be able to adapt to all the new technologies, all the new opportunities that come in with a world that is transforming. And that, that partnership that we've been able to build uh, with unions in building uh, training centers like this right across the country, focused on the jobs that are going to be you know, required to keep strong communities. I mean, everyone says, oh, the future is going to be, you know, all digital and the future is going to be all, all, you know, science and technology. Absolutely. Yes. And the jobs you are going to be doing are going to continue to get more sophisticated, require more and more uh, technology and computers to do it. But building a house is never going to be done by a robot. Right? The jobs, the skills you have are always going to be necessary. And, you know, they're, they can't be offshored. These are jobs that we're going to continue to need, particularly because Canada's population continues to grow. Because we remain one of the few countries around the world that is still extremely open and positive towards immigration, even at a time where people have been turning away and turning inwards in so many of our, uh, our uh, allied countries, that we know there is going to be a need for good, well-paid jobs long into the future in construction, in trades, in so many different areas where there are labor shortages, there are openness. I mean, the conversation I just had with uh, some of your leadership was, okay, how do we get more people in? We got more room, we got more jobs for people to come in. And as we see generation of young people coming through high school, coming through university wondering, okay, well, what do I do with this history degree? What do I do uh, with, uh, well, you know, the next things I want to do? Um, I'd really love to, to do something concrete and build something and shape something in, in my community. Well, there are great opportunities for that. We just have to understand and, and, and remember the extraordinary value and the respect 
that is owed to you and to people who do this work in keeping our communities prospering and growing long into the future. Thank you, Joshua. Another question? Yeah. No, there we go. As the, as, hi, my name is Kevin, right? So as this country expands and we're like being involved in building the homes, and that's like a physical tough job that we do. And, and to be honest, like a lot of us won't make retirement, right? And what is like the potential for a, an incentive for people coming that, you know, we need more tradesmen, we need more bricklayers, we need more carpenters, we need more people building the homes for the people coming yeah. and maybe potentially dropping our uh, like retirement age so we can maybe enjoy a couple of years. <laughs> Well, one of, one of the things, I mean, there was a lot of things I disagreed with our, our previous conservative government on, uh, including, you know, 377 and 525 that some of you may remember was anti-union legislation they brought in. One of the things that didn't get noticed as much was they actually raised the age of retirement from 65 to 67. Um, and I think that showed a fundamental misunderstanding of how hard a lot of Canadians work. Uh, that pushing off two years, not only did it just put more pressure on uh, the uh, provincial uh, welfare systems, because you'd have more people uh, being stuck on that for, for two more years, it was a way of shifting responsibility away, but it was also a, a fundamental disrespect uh, for workers. Uh, so we, one of the first things we did was brought it back to 65, uh, so there's at least that. But your question is a really good one, and we're seeing it in the construction industry, we're seeing a lot in healthcare as well, uh, where uh, the, the work uh, is, you know, a lot of people getting burnt out, a lot of people looking at different different careers, a career change after a certain point going into business for themselves, or uh, you know, taking uh, taking something that's not as as grueling on the body as as what you guys do. Um, part of that is we need to make sure you're getting better working conditions, and I know. Uh, your unions are there to make sure that working safe, working smart, uh, making sure that you're using technology in a way uh, that allows you uh, to not, you know, work decades at the cost of your body. So whenever you do get to retire, you're able to enjoy that retirement, which is a big piece of it. Um, <laughs> um, but the other thing is um, we need more people to come in. I mean, one of the big questions that we get all the time is, you know, as our government is raising immigration levels to the highest levels they've ever been, in a few years we'll be bringing in 500,000 people a year. Um, people are like, well, we're already facing challenges in housing. Um, you know, where are we going to house these 500,000 people a year? Well, a lot of those people will be able to contribute in the building trades. Uh, a lot of those people, particularly now that we are targeting, uh, a, we've made changes in our immigration system that allow us to target more specifically areas where there are skill shortages or trade shortages. I was just uh, talking uh, about some of the training centers uh, that you guys have in Portugal and other places that will allow people to get up to skills even before they come uh, to Canada so that they can hit the ground running, which is what we need. Uh, as soon as they get here. So these are things we're looking on. We need to renew our population. We need to renew our workforce. Everywhere around the world, uh, in de developed countries, uh, the population is aging. It's a real challenge for everyone. Uh, Canada is facing less of a challenge than others because uh, we're still growing through immigration. Uh, but there's more to do. Thank you for your question, Kevin. Appreciate it. Another question. Yeah, you in blue. Hi, Mr. Trudeau. My name is Claudia Mejia, and I'm a proud member of Local 1030. The work I perform is high-rise framing. Uh, here at the GTA, there are many undocumented workers in our industry that work very hard. Is your government looking to take any action to bring a future for the undocumented workers? A great question, Claudia. A um, couple of things. Uh, first of all, we need to do a better job of making sure that we are fully regulating uh, the system, that there isn't as much black market work, not as work done under the table. And there's things that the federal government can do through CRA um, 
most of the construction industry is regulated by the provinces, so it's really on the province uh, to, to stiffen up the oversight and make sure that every work, uh, every work site has uh, proper documentation, proper, uh, proper accounting, you know, proper you know, qualified tradespeople on it. Um, but we can help on that. But the flip side of it is we do know that there are a lot of people who uh, came to Canada in different ways and are right now undocumented. We know that's something that we need to change. We put forward a pilot project a few years ago uh, that uh, identified 500 people who were here already to, so they could get documented on a pathway to per permanent residency. Uh, we just doubled that pilot project. There's now a thousand more people that we're looking at in terms of that. So it's a step. But I will also be honest, it's something we'd like to do, but all the different pressures on our immigration system right now uh, from, uh, from the refugee crises, whether it's our, our friends in Ukraine, uh, whether it's our friends in Afghanistan, uh, whether it's people uh, right now just needing support uh, for families in Turkey or Syria, um, there are a lot of pressures on our system. Um, increasing the immigration levels interestingly will take some of the pressure off of the system uh, because the stream on bringing in permanent residents uh, is has got room to bring in more and it's when people come as refugees and try to flip or get refugee crisis that it, uh, status that it sort of slows down the system a little bit so increasing the levels will actually help bring in more people to respond to that and we're we're dealing with a, a shift in our approach to immigration as well. And I think sort of stepping back from that a little bit, one of the reasons Canada and Canadians have long been positive towards immigration is partially because of geography. People have confidence that we have an immigration system that works, that there are rules to follow, that people come here and, uh, you know, because they're qualified and because we have two big oceans, well, three big oceans on, on all three sides of us and a very attractive and warmer country immediately to our south, we haven't in our history over the past many decades had a lot of irregular migration which causes people in the States and in Europe to be a little more worried about uh, immigrants coming. So it's nothing innately Canadian that we're nicer or more generous. We just had you know, a certain amount of luck as a country to not have to deal with too much irregular migration. Um, over the past years, we've had a, a, a higher number of people coming in through Roxham Road in Quebec, uh, which has uh, caused a certain amount of consternation, not so much that we can't handle, but we have to be really present to make sure that we're supporting people as they, as they come through while discouraging them from doing that at the same time. So one of the things around immigration is we've always been able to have more people coming to wanting to come to Canada than we necessarily have room for. So we set up a system that, that put a little friction uh, in the immigration process to make sure that we just got the very best people and got a manageable number. Well, we're now in a situation where instead of having high unemployment like we've had for many, many eras in this country, we now need more people to fill good jobs in this country. So we're busy making a bit of a shift, not a huge shift, a bit of a shift towards bringing in more people more easily. We have to do it right because you don't suddenly want large numbers of Canadians to be worried that, oh no, you're bringing too many people, they're going to take jobs. Because the reality is when new Canadians come here, they create jobs, they create growth, they create prosperity as much as anything else. But you do want to make sure that you're, you're demonstrating that in a responsible way. So we're, we're busy trying to make that shift so that we can bring in more people. And as we get better systems, I really do look forward to being able to make sure that people who are undocumented, who've been here for a while, and families, are able to, to, to convert to becoming PRs and eventually citizens. At the same time, we have to make sure that everybody knows that we have a system that's based on rules and um, enforces those rules and, you know, people can't take shortcuts when other people have worked really hard and waited a long time to come here. So getting that balance right of being compassionate, of being there for our values, but also protecting the integrity of the system because it's it's one of the things that gives Canadians confidence in being open to immigration, as all the various things we're trying to juggle. But I, I hear you on that, and uh, we're, we're working on it.
Thank you, Claude. Question from over here. Yeah. Hang on, we'll just let the mic come to you. My name is Anna. I recently came here from Ukraine to Canada. And now I'm a proud member of Local 27 doing my siding course. Excellent. That said, my mind always brings my thoughts back home where the war still rages and fight for freedom still continues. I'm grateful that I have a refuge in Canada, but would like to know how you see Canada supporting Ukraine and Ukrainians. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you for your question and thank you for your, your, your courage. I know uh, it can't have been easy. Um, to leave your country in a difficult time, but I also know um, that Canadians are incredibly happy to be able to welcome you here. Um, we're happy to be uh, supporting Ukrainians, not just because of the challenges you're going through, but because there is such a deep connection between Canada and Ukraine that goes back uh, well over 100 years. Uh, Ukrainian Canadians are a, a, an integrated part of our, our country and have been for many, many generations. Uh, and of everyone in the world, well, we know how surprised Putin was uh, to see how strong, courageous, and tough Ukrainians are. Um, but Canadians weren't surprised because we've known Ukrainians a long time, uh, and they have added so much to Canada as proud Canadians and proud Ukrainians. So it is absolutely normal for us that we would stand up alongside you in every way we can to push back against Putin's uh, illegal and unconscionable invasion. Um, it's about recognizing the territory, the sovereignty, the integrity of Ukraine. It's about defending the right of Ukrainians to choose what they want their future to be. I mean, It's something many of us can take for granted, living in democracies, that every few years we get to pick who leads our country, what direction we're going in. To have someone from outside, like Vladimir Putin, deciding that no, we're going to build the future for Ukraine instead, is unacceptable to us. And that means that as Ukrainians are right now fighting and dying, for their territory, for their land, for their language, for their culture, for their identity. They're also, at the same time, standing up and fighting for the foundations of all of our democracies and all of our freedoms around the world. And that's why countries around the world are rallying to support Ukraine. Because your fight is our fight as well. And we are lucky. It's Ukrainians because you are so incredibly heroic and courageous in that fight. But think about it for a second. If Putin were to succeed, which he won't, but if he were to succeed in winning, in erasing Ukraine, what message would that send? to anyone else around the world who has a slightly bigger army than their neighbor. The you know, 75 years of stability, of peace that we had since the end of World War II around the world that led to an era of prosperity, of growth, of opportunity for so many of us around the world that saw billions of people lifted out of poverty all around the world would be once again put at risk if suddenly might becomes right once again. And that's, that's part of why Canada is so unequivocal in standing up for Ukraine. Because international rules-based order, the UN Charter that says, no, 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 you can't invade and decide to redraw lines on a map just because they speak a similar language or the same language as you, or because 300 years ago there was a Slavic empire that we're trying to recreate. That doesn't work. That doesn't work in our world right now. And if we don't stand up clearly and strongly against that, 
then we make everything more vulnerable for all of us. And that's why Canada is stepping up. And that's why, quite frankly, over the past few years, Canada was one of the handful of countries that stepped up to train the Ukrainian military uh, since uh, the invasion of Crimea. We have Operation Unifier, where Canadian uh, trainers are over in Western Ukraine. We've trained up about 35,000 uh, Ukraine uh, soldiers that have uh, led to, in part, uh, some of their tremendous success on the battlefields against, against the Russians in facing horrific and terrible odds and prevailing. And we've been there as well for economic and financial support so they can keep the lights on and they can continue to pay um, their public servants and their soldiers. We've been there with humanitarian aid to help get grain out. We've been there uh, with military aid to send sniper rifles and heavy armored vehicles and tanks uh, and equipment that is needed to ensure that Putin does not win and that anyone who looks at this moment in history says, yeah, that was a really bad idea. I'm not going to repeat that in my corner of the world. That's why Ukraine is so important and why we are so glad to stand with you and why we uh, will continue uh, to welcome in uh, Ukrainians uh, to contribute, to, to, to be well through the war. But I'm hoping that at least some of you will, even if you become Canadians full time, uh, will also uh, be part of the reconstruction of your beautiful country once it's done. I know uh, the, uh, the one of the nice things about Canadians is you don't have to pick your identity. You can layer on your identities. You can be a proud Ukrainian and a, and a proud Canadian at the same time. Uh, you can be a proud Canadian, a proud Italian, a prou proud Jamaican, a proud whatever part of the world you're coming from. Uh, we realize that that diversity and those different stories, those different experiences make our communities stronger and more resilient. And that's why, well, one of the many reasons we're so happy to have you. Thank you. Okay. Question from over here. There you go. I'm going to just keep going around. We'll catch, we'll catch everyone. Hello, Mr. Trudeau. Hi there. My name is Mary. I am a proud member of Hope Local 2022 with the Comforters of Ontario. I work in long-term care. I am a nurse, um, and I work through the pandemic. And there's been a crisis that we've learned since the pandemic. Um, my question is, what are you planning for long-term care so we uh, have a better future for, in long-term care? Thank you. Oh. Oh, no, sorry, if, 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 no, continue. No, it's, uh, first, I want to say thank you. Um, quite frankly, during the pandemic, uh, what we saw uh, in, you know, through the tragedy of long-term care homes, but also uh, through the tragedies in our healthcare system was even as so many of us were hunkered down at home, staying home to be safe the way we, we were told to and where we needed to, 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 to make sure we were doing everything we could through the first wave of that pandemic where nobody knew anything. We didn't yet have vaccines, you, you know. Healthcare workers and long-term care workers continue to show up at work. In, in really difficult circumstances. And you think about it, you know, they, for the most part, had families at home who were just as worried about what was going on and yet they were going and putting themselves at risk and running the risk of bringing it home to their families. But they knew that being there for our most vulnerable was unbelievably important. Uh, and I think we all, you know, as, we, as we watched in horror the vulnerability of our seniors and got further understanding of the challenges around quality of care that so many of them were in. Um, we also discovered that our most vulnerable elders were being cared for by people who were the second most vulnerable group, often um, immigrant women, often people in a very precarious work situation who themselves uh, were extremely at risk uh, in so many different ways. 
and as a society, I think it caused us all to need to take a real reflection on saying, okay, um, how do we care for those people who are most vulnerable around us? And how do we support people who care for the most vulnerable around us? Uh, and that's one of the reasons why uh, when, we, when we came through the pandemic, uh, the federal government made a commitment um, to invest billions of dollars, I think $3 billion, uh, towards uh, making sure that uh, people working in long-term care have proper working conditions. Because one of the things we learned is that working conditions determines conditions of care received uh, by people uh, in long-term care centers. So uh, we called on the for the creation of national standards uh, to make sure that whether it's around infection control or uh, support, um, that there is, there is an understanding of the, the, the standards that have to be achieved. Uh, we also put forward money to work with the provinces on this. Um, because as much as you know, people tend to look towards the federal government, and during the pandemic, uh, the federal government stepped up massively. It's the provinces that you know, manage long-term care. The provinces manage health care delivery. Uh, the federal government has a role to play around health care, and that is primarily ensuring that the Canada Health Act is always enforced, that um, your ability to receive care doesn't have anything to do with your ability to pay. It's one of those things that uh, Canadians are so proud of having a health care system, a care system that is universal and public. Uh, and that's where um, the federal government does have a real role to play to make sure that it's enforced, and we will always do that. But during the pandemic, we stepped up with about $72 billion on top of our usual investments in health care, about $40 billion a year. Um, because we knew that whether it was getting vaccines or PPE uh, or just putting more money into the provincial system so they could handle uh, the extra pressures, um, that's what we had to do to get through this pandemic. As we come out of it, there are lessons we learned, uh, big ones around long-term care, uh, which we're now uh, sitting now with the provinces to make sure uh, that we are looking at hitting those, 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 ca those um, benchmarks across the country. Not because the federal government's going to impose standards on provinces, but because Let's create national standards that the provinces themselves can aspire to. Um, we also are talking about getting uh, a minimum of $25 an hour for PSWs, uh, which we know is um, you know, probably close to what they should be earning, but uh, nowhere near where they are right yet. We can't take that on solely as a federal government, but it is, uh, it is a step of the way forward. But you may have seen as well that on health care, uh, we just put forward a significant amount of money uh, for the provinces to move forward on. Now, one of the challenges that there always is around health care is that the federal government, and it's not just around health care, it's around a lot of things. The federal government isn't the boss of the provinces. The way Canada came together, there was a division of powers in our constitution where the federal government takes care of national issues like Army and taxation and foreign policy and you know various national things. The environment uh, is a federal responsibility as well, and the provinces, the original provinces and the ones who added added on uh, over the years, 150 years ago, would take care of things like education, and social services, and health care delivery and those sorts of things. So we've always done these things together. So the challenge, though, is that the federal government isn't really in the business of delivering health care. So when we see health care systems overwhelmed, we don't have an automatic, okay, you need to do this to fix your health care system, or you need to do that, or we'll send you in more doctors. We don't do that at the federal level. So one of the things the federal government does do, however, is make sure through the Canada Health Act that Everyone across the country has access to a similar quality and caliber of care everywhere. And that gives us a little bit of a tool. So what we did recently in the health care agreements with the provinces is we said, okay, we're going to send more money to the provinces on health care because there is a need for more money, more investment. But we're going to expect that it gets spent in four different areas. 
areas that really matter, not just because they're priorities for Canadians, but they're the areas that if people get them right, the whole system gets better for everyone. First one is access to family doctors. How many people in here have a family doctor? Okay, that's not bad. How many people do not? Okay, you, your union's taking good care of folks. I approve of that. Um, but the reality is far too many Canadian families don't have access to family doctors or primary care physicians or even a, a family, uh, family health team. And what, what we want to do, what we need to do, is make sure that more people have access to a family doctor because it's not just having access to that. That's your entry path into the healthcare system. You need to see a specialist. You need to see, you, know, you have a particular problem. You're facing mental health challenges. Having someone in the system that you can call who knows you, who knows your family, is much more efficient than having to show up at the emergency room uh, to see a whole bunch of people who don't know you, uh, who are trying to deal with you, and deal with all the backlogs of, of other emergencies that are coming there as well. So incre increasing people's access to family doctors is something that's going to happen um, because of what we're doing. The second one is more on mental health. Uh, we know that mental health is health, and it's linked to so much else. In the origins of the Canada Health Act, in the beginning of our establishment of a health system, um, mental health wasn't super emphasized. There's still a lot of sense of, oh, you know, if, you know it's, it's not really the same as health. It doesn't really count as everything else. And the stigmatization around mental health meant that very few people would actually put up their hands and say, okay, I need help right now. I'm going through a really difficult time or my family's suffering. Even though it's either one in three or one in five Canadians uh, who suffer with mental health issues, which means we all know people who are suffering from mental health challenges at various points in their lives. So we've done a good job of destigmatizing, of saying things like, well, you're sick, you're not weak. If you have a bad kidney, we're not going to tell you, well, just really concentrate and try to get over it. Well, no, we're going to give you medication, we're going to give you treatment, we're going to give you supports. If you're dealing with a chemical imbalance in your brain, if you're dealing with mental health issues, it's not just about, well, toughen up and get through it. There are treatments. There's support. There are ways of getting better. And people are getting a lot more comfortable raising up their hands and saying, I need help. One of the challenges is our systems have been built counting on very few people who are actually struggling to put up their hands. So over the past years, as more and more people are saying, yeah, no, I need real support, our systems are getting overwhelmed. So putting more money into mental health and not just in a little box labeled mental health, but understanding that mental wellness, mental health treatments should be woven through everything else in the healthcare system, should be much more active in the community, frontline uh, first responders should absolutely, whether it's police or fire or, 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 or paramedics or whatever, should be there to help people in crisis. But imagine for a second that all of us we're more trained in mental health first aid, where, you know, barbers and bank tellers and, and you know, garbage collectors were all there to see, okay, if someone's in crisis, how can I help? How can be helpful? You create more resilience around that. So investments around mental health. Next one is support for uh, people who work in the healthcare systems. Uh, making sure that we're uh, recognizing credentials, getting people into it faster, bringing along relief, getting better working conditions. That's a big one. And the fourth area is better data. Better data. You show up at a, uh, an emergency room, people should be able to see you know, what your last tests were, who your doctor is, what specialist you've been seeing for what. You move provinces, you, be able to, you should be able to bring your file with you and have it understood. And we should be able to compare outcomes across the country to make sure that the places that have figured out how to do things better and more efficiently and get better outcomes are learned from. So those are the four things we're putting into 
our expectations. Every province will decide which of those four is more important and how to, how to balance it out. But these are things, particularly with the accountability, that are going to lead to res of information, lead to better results on healthcare. And part of that is, to go back to your original question, how we ensure better long-term care standards and better support for people in long-term care, whether it's uh, elders or, or vulnerable populations of various types. So thank you for your work, Mary. All right, question from the back there. Okay, no, we'll go to you. Uh, hi, Mr. Trudeau. Sorry. Um, my name is Nicole Ross. I did my Red Seal through Local 27, but now work as a high school construction teacher. Um, I have a question about apprentices, where a lot of our apprentices learn the trade on job sites, but a lot of employers actually prefer hiring qualified journey persons. I was wondering if you have a plan or if you can think of a way to link federally funded construction projects with a mandate or a requirement to hire more apprentices? Uh, yeah, that's a great question, Nicole. Um, the, you know, the federal government isn't just the place that sets, you know, the rules for so many industries and federal, we're also a really big procurer of services and construction and funder of constructions across the country. So one of the things we are looking is a minimum thresholds for apprentices on job sites that have federal funding flow to them. Uh, so that's one way of ensuring uh, that you get apprentices in the mix uh, to make sure that people are getting the, the skills. Uh, we're also moving forward on uh, increasing the grants uh, for apprenticeships so more people can afford to go in uh, and get, the, get training in the trades. Um, the idea of, of course people want, you know, the top pros, but, you know, to go back to healthcare a bit, you know, so often we show up, we're in teaching hospitals where, you know, you've got a med student along with a doctor and they're going to, you know, they're going to pull your blood and they're going to do those things. You, we need to be training uh, that next generation every step of the way. Uh, and how we can ensure that we are encouraging, supporting, and helping people become apprentices and get those hours and get those opportunities as apprentices is how we ensure that even as our population grows, as our economy grows, uh, we're going to be able to meet that moment even with an aging population. So I, I thank you directly for all the work you're doing as a high school teacher. I used to be a high school teacher and I miss it every day. Um, but uh, it's, uh, it's uh, something that is really important that you keep doing. Thank you, Nicole. Yes, sir. Uh, there's a mic right behind you. Just right behind you. Hello, Prime Minister. My name is Errol Jean, and um, a long-standing uh, union member. Now, my concern is the economy. I mean, like, we've gone just crazy from about August on to about now. Um, the bank rates have gone up. Gasoline, I mean, we all got to get to work the whole nine yards. I want to know what is your company, sorry, what is your <laughs> government doing to help us with this problem? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question, Errol, uh, and a really important one. And, and you highlight uh, that the past few months have been really, really difficult. Um, fuel prices going up, um, you know, challenge around grocery prices, uh, rents going up. Uh, the inflation, which is just starting to come down, we're now at 5.9%, which is nice to see it down, and it's going to keep coming down, um, caused a, an awful lot of stress on a whole bunch of people over these past, uh, past many months. And it's your reality. Right? It doesn't make you feel any better for me to say, oh, it's linked to the war in Ukraine and the coming out of the pandemic and everything like that. Okay, there's all those reasons but it's really real. And it doesn't also help, Errol, for me to say, well, it's worse, and worse in the UK and it's worse in the US and it's worse over here. That doesn't help you pay your grocery bills here either. Right? These are tough times. Uh, more Canadians than ever before are using food banks. Uh, people are really worried about uh, whether they're gonna be able to you know, follow along if they have a variable uh, interest, uh, variable rate uh, mortgages. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty and anxiety. Um, one of the things we did this fall uh, was say, and one of the challenges with inflation is some of the tools that a government has to respond to tough times don't work the same way. If we were to simply say as a government, okay, um, 
everything's too expensive for everyone, we're going to mail everyone $1,000 cash, and uh, that'll help them afford their groceries. Well, that would instantly bump up inflation, and it would be like we didn't send any money to you at all. So we have to be very, very targeted in what we do to help people out. We did three things uh, in the fall that were targeted towards the people who are suffering the most. Uh, the first one uh, is we doubled the GST rebate for 11 uh, million uh, Canadians, uh, which meant for over six months they got uh, hundreds of dollars more uh, to help them out through that, uh, through that difficult time. Uh, we also moved forward with uh, an extra top up to the housing benefit to make sure that the lowest income renters uh, have a little more space. And the big one we did was make sure that families who couldn't send their kids to the dentist can now uh, send their kids to the dentist at 12 and under. And that one is not because, and, you know, for, for an interesting reason, I'm not entirely sure why, the Conservatives actually voted against that one. They said that no, sending uh, families to the dentist would be causing inflation or it would be contributing to inflation and we shouldn't be doing that. And I think for a lot of families whose kids uh, are, who don't have the means to pay, they're going to still send their kids to the dentist out of their own pocket and try and forego or you know, squeeze ends uh, in other ways. So this will relieve those families who do it, but it will also allow some families to send their kids to the dentist in other ways. Because we know, going back to healthcare, mouth health is health again. So we're doing that. And that's a way to target certain families that were most vulnerable. On top of that, things like the Canada Child Benefit, um, which has lifted hundreds of thousands of kids out of poverty, hundreds of dollars a month tax-free uh, arriving in the, in the bank accounts of families that need it, um, is indexed to inflation. So it has gone up to, to balance that a little bit. Um, further than that, just last year, we cut childcare fees in half across the country, and that was hundreds, even thousands of dollars of savings for a whole bunch of different families. And we had to do this, and we had to make sure we were doing it in really targeted ways that wouldn't cause the Bank of Canada to decide that it needed to raise interest rates any higher than necessary. Because that's the tool that the Bank of Canada has, that's independent from the government, to quash, interest, uh, to quash inflation. It raises interest rates to try and slow down the economy that's running a little too hot, which is why there's inflation. Well, there's a few different ways to go at inflation. One, yes, the Bank of Canada has raised rates, and we had to make sure that we weren't going to push those rates any higher. But second, there's challenges around supply chains that are causing shortages that drive up prices on things. So we've been investing in infrastructure, including port infrastructure, that's going to flow things through. So our goal right now is to make sure we're supporting people directly who really need it, who are in precarious situations, and have the rest of us just continue to hang in there and be there for each other because we're seeing inflation come down. As inflation comes down, interest rates are going to start coming down as well. And then we get to look at how is the Canadian economy doing in general despite that? Now, and this is not to say that people aren't facing really challenging times, but we have a higher employment level in Canada than we've had in generations, if ever. More people have jobs. And the big challenge around recessions or global slowdowns is people get fired. They lose their jobs and then they risk losing their homes and they get risk massive disruptions. We're not out of the woods yet, but even as the global economy is slowing, which in variable will have an impact on Canada, we don't see signs that a lot of people are going to be losing their jobs in Canada. And if you have a job, yes, things can be tough, and maybe you have to have two jobs, but you're going to make it through. And what are we looking at for the next six months? What are we looking at the next year, the next five years, the next ten years? Well, Canada is remarkably well positioned for that. We have a growing population at a higher rate than any of our fellow G7 countries. We have uh, natural resources. Right now, Europe is in real trouble because it was so reliant 
on uh, Russia for cheap oil and gas, that cutting off and not relying on Russia anymore has caused massive disruptions for them that they were able to get through, but it was really, really tough and a big contributor to inflation on that one. Um, Canada has a, a, a incredibly well-educated population. We have the best educated working population of any country in the world. And that gives an opportunity for, country, for companies around the world uh, to invest in, uh, to, to come. And one of the reasons we're seeing uh, the arrival of um, big manufacturing companies, whether it's in the auto sector, whether it's in, in batteries, in critical minerals, in steel, like these are things that people are realizing Canada is a stable and steady place to do business that has supply chains and resources in a really great way. We have trade deals uh, with the world, free trade with two-thirds of the global economy. That means uh, there's a lot of companies interested in coming and investing in Canada. There are all these advantages that we have that the world is now looking to. We're leading the way on, on, on fighting climate change as well. Even as we're continuing to be reliant on oil and gas, because the world's going to be reliant on oil and gas for many more years, we're doing a lot of really innovative work in reducing the carbon emissions associated with that. Carbon capture and sequestration, more efficient processes, the innovators and incredible hard workers in the energy sector, particularly in Alberta and Saskatchewan, are leading the way in transforming our energy mix and creating, whether it's the hydrogen or the CCUS or other solutions for the future, that really positions Canada extremely well for the global economy. So, yes, we're facing a tough time right now like everyone else is around the world, but the bones of the economy are really strong and the opportunities we have to build a better future are real. So, part of what we've been doing over the past seven years as, as government is focus on making sure that everyone gets a real and fair chance to succeed. Uh, so, initiatives like the Canada Child Benefit or Child Care, uh, initiatives like a national housing strategy that's investing to start building once again housing uh, where the federal government for decades before was disengaged from housing. Things that are building the building blocks of success for Canadians, individual Canadians, their families and their communities. It's not the kind of trickle down that says, okay, big business, we're going to leave you free reign and you'll eventually create jobs and opportunities for everyone else. That doesn't work. That's never worked. But it's still an argument we're having in the House of Commons against the Conservatives. Um, where we see incredible partnerships that we've built up over the past eight years is uh, with organized labor, with unions who are a guarantor of good, strong, middle-class jobs, you're doing the work that needs to happen for this country, that Canadians can take pride in and feed their family and support their communities and create vibrant economies out of that. We've got all those things at a time of, of uncertainty around the world where Canada is a little more stable, a little more, um, a little more rife with opportunity for everyone. So, Yes, times are tough right now, but we have a, together as Canadians, a vision of optimism for the future that I'm really excited about. I mean, Canada's not a country that happened by accident. A whole bunch of people came here trying to build a better life for themselves and their families and worked their asses off to do that and built success from one generation to the next didn't happen randomly. It happened because people believed in building a stronger country and saw the tough times and said, wow, not, oh, I'm going to throw up my hands, it's too tough. It's saying, no, 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 we're going to get over this. And that's how we've created this country. But it won't continue without effort, without minding, without being there to do the work, to lean in on it, and to plan for the best and work hard for it. That's who Canadians are. That's what we got to continue to do. So right now, it's, there's an ease out there in political circles. Throw up your hands and say, oh, everything's broken. It's all broken. It's just, you know, we have to change and start over. Well, you know what? They tried that down in the United States. Someone who said he was going to fix everything and fed into anger and, and, and disconnect and frustration by so many people in the United States. It didn't leave them any better off. On the contrary. 
What we need to do is understand that, yeah, people are angry and frustrated, and there's lots of reasons to be, and we're stressed out, and it's been hard, and there's mental health challenges and anxiety and, and frustration, sure. Yes. But what is responsible leadership? Is responsible leadership saying, yeah, you should be mad and make you even madder and give you misinformation and disinformation to make you even madder and to amplify that so that you go out in the streets and, and, and you know, vote to tear things down? Or do you say, yeah, this is really tough. And you're right to be mad and you're right to be frustrated, but let's solve this together. And here are the solutions. Here is how we can build a better country. This is what we can do to build a better future. That's the challenge around the economy. And there's two very different ideas on display for Canadians over the coming years as we move towards an election on you know, whether we build responsibly for the future with a reasonable and rational plan or we give in to the politics of envy, of anger, of division, of, of you know, amplifying the anxiety and torquing it up to gain political power, but then to do what with it? You know, over the past eight years, we have built a strong economy that can weather these storms. And I think that's what we're going to continue to do as Canadians. Thank you for that, Errol. Sorry. That was a bit of a rant. Okay, I'm going to take uh, three questions now. One, two, three, and then I'll, I'll take those quickly, and then I'll keep moving around. But I will shorten my answers as well. Go ahead. Good evening, Mr. Prime Minister. My name is Brent Duell. I'm a proud member of Local 27. Uh, Carpenters Union. I'm also a member of the Canadian Armed Forces and the Reserves. Um, that's how I got here, through Helmets to Hard Ass program. It's a great program. Uh, what other supports like H2H, Helmets to Hard Ass, can be offered to veterans uh, for transition to civilian life? Great question, Brent. Thank you. Uh, next question. There's, uh, I'll take two more. Yeah, you in the red. Right behind you. Brian Pico, Local 27 member for over 20 years. I'm just wondering, there's this like, stigma out there that like, trade members are like second-class citizens compared to university educated. And you even said yourself, we're the most educated, like Canada's the most educated in the world. But that's education. Like my sister over there, she probably has a hard time finding students coming into trade. Our, our members, like the people that run our union are finding a hard time. Sure, we're bringing uh, like immigrants. Without immigrants, I wouldn't be here. But how do we like show that without us, we can't do shit, right? People can't work. How are they going to clean their toilets, right? Like, they need our trade. We need. They need us, right? Great question. So how do Brian. we show them that come into the trades, the next generation, like the younger? Outstanding question, Brian. And last question. So of this round, I'll come to more. Michael Brennan. I'm a longtime member of Local 27 in the Concrete Formwork Division. I just got finished up uh, working at the, that fabulous addition to Sick Kids Hospital in downtown Toronto. And, uh, you know, I'm really proud of the work that I did there, the really proud of the work that my crew did there. And, um, you know, just kind of wondering if you're ever, if you've ever thought about coming on site, you know, just even for a few hours. I think it could be really inspiring for the workers. And, you know, just to touch on uh, Brian's point there a little bit, you know, some of us feel, and maybe some of us in this room feel that the, the work that we do, the skilled work that we do, is kind of taken for granted. Yeah. Great. Great question, Michael. Um, first of all, Brent, the, the skills that you learned uh, in, the, in the Canadian Armed Forces, the work that you've done, the service that you chose to give to your country uh, in that, uh, leaves you um, better equipped uh, to be able to contribute all your life to this country. It is uh, an extraordinary uh, extraordinarily important thing for us that uh, people who uh, leave the CAF uh, are properly supported in that time of transition because you go from a very, very regimented, um, you know, hierarchical, structured universe to, you know, being on your own. And even as you come at it with all sorts of skills and abilities, there is a transition. And that's why we've made uh, significant uh, historic investments, not just in H2H, but in other programs like that, to encourage that and to also encourage um, young people to think about 
uh, going into the military as a stepping stone to uh, finding their path in life and developing their skills so that they can contribute, whether it's in the military as a career or more likely uh, in the next things they choose to do. Uh, but, you know, your service and all those who serve deserve uh, to be supported not just while they are serving, uh, but after they serve so they can continue to, to contribute to their country. So I thank you very much for that and we're going to continue doing that. Um, Brian and Michael, your, your, your questions are, are, are similar. First of all, uh, you know, Michael, uh, I would love uh, to come visit the job site. It's, uh, uh, again, the province doesn't tend to let me on there too much because it's more uh, provincial investments building hospitals than, than federal investments. Uh, but I get the opportunity to visit job sites uh, across the country and do all I can to congratulate folks uh, for uh, doing the work that keeps, keeps this country growing and keeps this country moving. And it's not just the work you do building these homes. It's the fact that you do this work and then you come home and uh, you're part of a community and you're able to feed your family and support and take pride in that work and make sure that the neighborhoods and the communities that you're part of are prosperous and you create a a success for this country by these good jobs at the step in, in the middle class that are the heart of the country. I mean, you cannot build an economy from the top down. You have to build it from the middle class outwards. And that's the promise that we made in 2015 to start uh, investing in the middle class and people working hard to join it that has actually been able to do two things. We've reduced child poverty and reduced poverty uh, to a greater degree than just about any other time in this country at the same time as we have created millions of jobs. We've done both of those things together which in the minds of some is either one or the other. Well you can either have a strong safety net or you can have a successful economy. You can't have both. And what modern economic theory is starting to show is that when you actually, be honest, when you're putting good jobs and more money with a higher minimum wage, for example, into the pockets of more citizens, you know, the business owners, the wealthy folks, they're going to find ways to make money off of people who have more disposable income, who are doing better. The economy does better when everyone is prospering uh, to a respectable level. When, when the amount of investments it takes from a government to support uh, people who are, uh, who are incredibly vulnerable and not being able to provide, not being able to reach their potential, is, is much greater than what it takes to invest in them just enough so that they can get the good education, get the supports, and go and contribute and build a life and buy their own home or, or, or build their own future. So that's where the trades specifically, in a time where you know the, the world is filled with people working in retail with university degrees right now because they, they studied things that didn't necessarily bring them towards uh, a, a job at a time where they're significant labor shortages for welders, for carpenters, for, for, for so many different, and yes, we're bringing more people in, as you say, Brent, but I think there's a shift that has to happen, and honestly, it's in the mindsets both of parents and of young people to understand that um, I mean, the number of people who go to university and then go to trade school so they can get a job that's not necessarily, I mean, for some people that's a good path, but that's not necessarily the best and most efficient path to a career. Uh, and valuing and respecting the work that people do uh, when, and when you think about it, the, 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 the combination of a bit of creativity, some significant physical skill, uh, and some training and knowledge all together that is embodied in, in the trades of whatever different type, is the kind of thing that gives you a satisfaction in work that is that feels realer than than so many other jobs out there not to knock some of the jobs but when you're actually building things and doing things I mean there's a reason people love to you know do crafts in their garage even as they are lawyers or everything like that the, the satisfaction of building of doing things is something that I you know I got to mess around in my wood shop with my, with my kids this weekend as they were rolling their eyes at the contraptions I'm building. Like doing things concretely 
is unbelievably satisfying, and I think we do have to do a much better job of sharing that, of valuing that, so people can actually understand the good jobs, the great pay, and uh, the ability to build stronger communities that comes with it. So thank you very much. Okay, I think we have time for one last round of three questions, so we'll go you, and then you, and then you, sir. There we go. So, uh, yes, black sweatshirt here first. No, sorry, you'll go right there. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Brooke, and I am a carpenter at Local 27. Um, I just had a question about uh, grants for women, like apprentices. Um, because you have a grant that is uh, expiring in March, I believe, and I was wondering if you had any um, idea if you're going to continue that to help us be successful. Excellent question. Okay, next. Bonsoir. Bonsoir. Je m'appelle Rokaya Gay. On m'appelle Rock. Rock, excellent. Oui. Et je suis une fière, euh, je suis un, un membre fier de Local 27. So my name is Rakaya Gay. <laughs> People call me Rock. I'm a, a proud member of Local 27. So I'm a carpenter. Uh, right now, I do scaffolding, already done uh, form work. So my question is, Mr. Trudeau, uh, is um, one of the biggest barriers for women uh, in the trade, uh, it's like for joining the skilled trade, really, and getting a career into the skilled trade, is really childcare. And um, I was one of them also where I had to make a decision between joining construction or taking care of them because the uh, daycare opened that hours where um, our, our workers, we work on hours that are very unique where it's not open yet. So do you have any, um, any solutions? Any, like are you, is the government planning to really invest in solutions in childcare for us so that more women will join the trade? Wonderful. Yes. The answer is yes, but I'll get to that in a second. And your question, sir. You know, we just, uh, here we go. Thanks, Mr. Prime Minister. Uh, the fentanyl crisis. What's your name? Sorry. Philip Wiley, and uh, I'm a member of Local 27. Thank you. Uh, the fentanyl crisis that's uh, tearing across the, the nation. Um, I was wondering if, uh, if the success of the legalization of cannabis does that set an example and a potential pathway to deal with this real crisis that's killing people, killing Canadians, and tearing apart families? And, and not just you know, that, that tragedy, but uh, the fact that uh, a lot of hardworking, taxpaying, law-abiding Canadian citizens have to commit a criminal act to access these sorts of recreational substances. Oh, uh, thank you for your question, Phil. Um, first of all, Brooke and, and, and Rock, um, we need more women in the trades. Uh, we have seen, I mean, as, as so many of the trades are less focused on uh, brute strength of you know, the way it used to, I mean, there's so much more technology, there's so much more supports, uh, people of all sorts of different size and skills can develop uh, develop extraordinarily uh, successful careers in that, and that's a good thing. Uh, we're seeing we're seeing the kinds of um, innovation, the kinds of culture in 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 the community of uh, of workers uh, change as more and more women are getting into it, and it's it's a good thing. Uh, we need more, uh, and that's why we have set up. Uh, apprenticeship uh, programs, grants for women apprentices, uh, and we plan on continuing them. I don't know all the details. I don't know if I'm making an announcement that we shouldn't be making it because we want to make it with bells and whistles uh, in a few weeks, but I can tell you that the work we've done to make sure that we're getting more women in the trades is going to continue, um, partially because uh, because we need more people to get into the trades. Uh, we need more to do that, and, and getting good jobs uh, for women the same way we're trying to create more pathways for uh, new Canadians, more pathways for Indigenous, Cana uh, indigenous people to get uh, into uh, these, uh, these jobs, um, because they are good jobs that sustain families and sustain communities. So yes, we're going to be doing more. Uh, I don't know exactly the programs we're unveiling, whether we're continuing that one or creating a new one. Uh, but yes, we will continue to do everything we can. I, uh, a few years ago, I, uh, I met uh, Mandy Renahan for the first time. Uh, she's an inspirational um, you know, trade leader 
uh, who uh, from the East Coast who is incredibly passionate about getting more women into the trades and she's done a, a really good job of challenging systems and unions to do uh, do a better job around recruitment and and uh, hopefully that'll that'll continue. Uh, Rock, uh, quel magnifique français, quel plaisir de pouvoir uh, uh, parler ma langue uh, ici avec vous. Uh, mais uh, je vais répondre en anglais pour que tout le monde puisse me comprendre. Um, 50 years ago, uh, the Royal Inquiry into uh, the status of, the Royal Commission on the Status of Women, number one recommendation was um, better access to childcare. Um, it is something that is foundational for a successful society. Uh, and as you say, far too many families are faced with the choice of, of, okay, you either have one parent stay home with the kids while the other works, or both parents go to work uh, and you pay for childcare. But if that second parent's job isn't gonna cover the childcare bills, well, she, because it's usually she, uh, has to put her career on hold and do the, the, the focus on the child rearing. Um, there should be a choice. Uh, and that's why, and one of the things that actually came, there's few silver linings from the pandemic, but one of the things that I will accept is a silver lining of the pandemic is everyone suddenly during those months of lockdown understood how challenging it is to work when the kids are at home from school. And there was a window in which something we've been talking about for decades could actually happen. And the federal government stepped up and signed about $30 billion worth of deals with the provinces um, so that last year, childcare fees were cut in half right across the country, which has saved hundreds and even thousands of dollars for many families with young kids. And they're on their way uh, to getting to $10 a day childcare right across the country in the coming two or three years. That, and that's, you know, on a, on a more political level, it's a perfect example of something uh, that I feel we get as a political party that uh, the Conservatives, for example, didn't. They voted against, they campaigned against our childcare deals. Not understanding, well, because you know, we don't believe in social programs is their excuse or, or something along the lines. Well, affordable childcare isn't a social program, well, partially a social program, but mostly it's an economic program. It's a growth program. It gives an opportunity for people to contribute and succeed and build futures for their family in extraordinary ways. So part, part of the deals around childcare, yes, was get it down to $10 a day uh, within five years. Some provinces are already there, others are working hard on it. Um, cut it in half in that first year, which has made a big difference, especially in places like Ontario where childcare fees were so high. But also to add more spaces, uh, because if you can't find a space at $10 a day, um, it doesn't matter that it's only $10 a day. Uh, so adding more space is a big piece of it, but also making sure we're paying early childhood educators on a competitive uh, pay scale so that you can get not just $10 a day childcare, not just more spaces for childcare, but also quality childcare. There's other elements we put into those childcare deals as well, making sure uh, that there is uh, cultural sensitivity, the room for indigenous communities to have access to childcare, making sure that, uh, that uh, your children can find childcare spaces in French, even here in the GTA, uh, making sure that uh, official languages are covered uh, in childcare, but also before and after school child care. I was talking with a bunch of nurses the other day who were saying that, uh, yeah, we work the night shift. Um, how do we get child care for our kids, uh, you know, as, as we're stuck in, 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 uh, in an overnight shift? Like, what do we, what do we do? And these are things that we are, that we put in there, that we're working on. They're needing to be worked on, but they are a priority that we're going with. And finally, uh, Phil, thank you for your question. First of all, the opioid epidemic is something that has uh, devastated communities right across the country. Um, very few families haven't been touched directly or indirectly from uh, the challenges. And it's not, it's not about uh, inner city drug users, although yes, they are affected by it. 
Um, it's about suburban families. It's about someone who has a bad back who, you know, gets a prescription and gets hooked on them and then has to, has to as you say, uh, find different sources for their, uh, for their pain meds. The fact that we have a poisoned drug supply, the fact that uh, fentanyl and others uh, are um, slipping into uh, the drug supply uh, requires us to act. Now, you, you asked about legalization of cannabis. Um, thank you, because nobody talks about that anymore. But it was a really hard thing to do uh, when we did that. And, and it, was, it was one of the first things uh, we did to show, well, to, to, to show that we were going to be evidence-based in our approach. It just made no sense to me that um, you know, alcohol was, was legal but controlled, uh, but it was actually easier for kids to buy a joint than a bottle of beer. Um, and you know, cannabis may be less harmful than alcohol than most other drugs, but it's still a drug and you want to control it. You want to make sure that you're getting safe supply. And the fact that there is now Health Canada approval for cannabis out there has, uh, we're not totally where we need to be yet, but we've made significant impression, uh, improvements and it has shown a good thing. Um, it's not as easy to just go straight towards legalization on harder drugs or on opioids, and it's not necessarily the right thing to do. But you may remember about 10, 12 years ago, there was a huge hubbub when um, the previous government shut down access to medical grade heroin to people who uh, were addicts. And that was exactly against all the science and data and understanding of how you actually treat people in this. So one of the things that we've been able to do over the past eight years, grounded in science, grounded in what works, is move towards uh, harm reduction and safe supply. Um, multiplying the numbers of safe consumption sites uh, around the country, making sure that people uh, have access to uh, medical grade or artificial uh, opioid substitutes or prescription opioids as a way of helping them through this so that they're not buying dangerous street drugs uh, that could be laced with and are laced with uh, all sorts of horrific and deadly substances. Um, the big thing is to get the question of addictions out of the criminal justice system and into a health approach. There are addictions treatments that are much more health-based uh, that have to do as well with uh, community treatments that have to do with a quality of life. Sometimes, you know, housing is one of the best things you can do against addiction in, in, in some cases. But making sure we're treating it as a medical uh, situation is really important. One of the things that we did recently is we allowed British Columbia to move forward with a project that actually uh, moves towards the decriminalization of uh, possession of personal amounts, small amounts of uh, a range of harder drugs, including opioids. Um, that's a big step to get the police out of that business of arresting people who are addicted and uh, looking up the food chain as well, but also being able to deal with it as a, as a public health crisis. It's not a situation with easy solutions, um, and it's one that we all have to work together, but the more we ground ourselves in data and evidence, and the less we ground ourselves in sort of um, the nimbyism, the not in my backyard, that says, no, 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 we don't want this near us, or uh, you know, we don't want uh, you know, treatment centers or we're going to, you know, leave people isolated and alone and stigmatized. That's not a solution. It may be satisfying, you know, to, to, you know, lash out in a YouTube video or spread misinformation, but to ground yourself in compassion, in medical supports, in uh, addressing not just the addiction, but the many factors that may have contributed to the addiction. It may just be a workplace injury. Uh, it may be cycles of, of, of poverty or, or, or trauma that someone's dealing with. We have to have a compassionate, science-based approach to that, and that's what this government has tried to do. So, no, we're not moving towards legalization anytime soon of, no, we're not, let me rephrase that so it doesn't get clipped. Um, we're not moving towards legalization of harder drugs, but we are taking a uh, public health-based approach. 
We are taking a science-based approach. We have moved forward with decriminalization in a jurisdiction that said we're ready for it, we're having the supports, we have the approach to do it right uh, in BC, uh, and we're all eager to see how it works and how it can be improved and how it can be uh, brought elsewhere around the country to save more lives. I'll tell you guys a secret. This is one of my favorite things to do ever. Um, the opportunity to actually hear from you what you're thinking. We talk about what we're doing in long sentences, not you know, sound bites or bumper stickers, um, to be able to engage. This is what was hardest for me about the pandemic, um, about everything we'd had to do by Zoom, uh, everything that we've had to do distance from each other, being able to come back and engage. Uh, and listen and hear you directly and answer a few of your questions and uh, hopefully set you thinking on um, the things you can do to conti continue to, to contribute to, uh, uh, to your community, to your uh, country, to the greatest democracy on earth, uh, in my opinion, um, is really appreciated. And I thank you. I know you all uh, chose to come here on an evening where you could have been with family, you could have been uh, elsewhere. Uh, to come out for uh, an opportunity to exchange like this is something that I really, really value. Uh, and I thank you deeply for being here tonight. Merci beaucoup, mes chers amis.